So I'm an emergency doctor, and I'm going to tell you about a patient that I saw in the emergency room a few years ago. It was towards the end of a busy shift, and I'd, I'd made the mistake of thinking that I might be able to get home early when an ambulance arrived with a new patient. And it was an older gentleman who was having trouble breathing. Now, you can learn a lot from just watching someone breathe. And so as the ambulance guys were rattling off his numbers, I, I just watched. And what I saw made me very nervous. When, when most people breathe, we use our, our diaphragm and we use the muscles of our, of our chest wall. When you have a hard time breathing, you also start using the muscles up here that are called the accessory muscles of breathing in your shoulders and your neck. When you get tired of breathing, it's not like other muscles. You can't just kind of give them a break. Breathing doesn't work like that. And when I watched my patient breathe, I could see him getting tired. I could see every single muscle of his chest standing out, trying to get in air. And I knew that even though I didn't know what he had, whether it was a pneumonia or heart failure or something else, I knew he didn't have long. There's no good way to tell someone that they're about to die. And so I just took a deep breath and I said it. His daughter had just walked into the room and both he and his daughter were devastated. They were heartbroken and who wouldn't be? But there was something else as well, which is that they were surprised. Surprise has a number of problems in this situation. The, the first and most obvious is that it takes a tragic situation and turns it into a terrifying situation for patients and for families. But, but that's not the worst part. The worst part is that surprise means people are not prepared. And when people aren't prepared, they haven't had time to think. Surprised people do not make good decisions, especially not about life or death. So I want you guys to imagine for a moment that you're living with a serious illness. Maybe it's heart failure, maybe it's cancer. And someone asks you, when you look ahead, when the time comes, what does a good death look like to you? If you're like most other people in this country, we have a lot of survey data, and so I already know what you're going to say. The data are very clear. Everyone wants to die at home, surrounded by family. No one wants to be hooked up to a machine. Everyone wants to have had time to put their affairs in order to make peace with themselves and often with God. And that's what people say when they have time to look ahead. But now, let's go back to the ER. Imagine you're my patient, or maybe it's your dad. Imagine someone's just told you that you're a few heartbeats away from death. Now quick, decide. Do you want a breathing tube and a medically induced coma? Do you want to be hooked up to a ventilator? Should I get you a bed in the ICU? What about a tight-fitting, pressurized mask as an alternative to the breathing tube that might eventually diminish our chances of putting in the breathing tube effectively? That's a lot to think about when you're hyperventilating and terrified and in shock. And people in shock do not make very good decisions. So I'll tell you what usually happens in these situations, which is someone very much like me will say, you know what? this is really hard. Let's just put in the breathing tube. Let's see how it goes. Let's put him in the ICU, j just for now. And that's like you're drowning and someone throws you a life raft. And it sounds so reasonable that that's what we do. So the patient goes up to the ICU. And one decision leads inexorably to another decision. Let's put in a permanent surgical tube in the trachea to support his breathing for a little longer. While we're in the operating room, let's just put in a feeding tube to support his nutrition, too. Let's add on some medications for pain, because he looks uncomfortable. I mean, they'll make him confused, but we can't leave him like this. After the ICU, let's plan on getting him to a long-term hospital, because that's really the only place where they can manage all these tubes, and he's too weak to go home. One intervention leads to more interventions, and months later, patients are still cycling between hospitals and nursing homes. They're subjected to uncomfortable and invasive procedures. And along the way, they generate enormous costs, costs that threaten the entire viability of our health system. It's not an outcome that anyone wants, 
but it happens all the time, one decision after another. So what if we could see further? What if we had more time to think, more time to plan ahead for the kinds of decisions we want to make rather than the decisions we have to make when it's a split second and we're terrified? When I was younger, when I was a teenage boy, I, I read a lot of um, science fiction and fantasy novels. There were some role-playing games. And I am a huge nerd, which you could probably tell. And so it was always very natural for me in my research to start thinking about a world of crystal balls, a world where we could trace someone's illness all the way from today to the day of their death. And I'll tell you something about my patient that makes this sound maybe more like science and less like science fiction. So I remember when I was reading through his medical record, shaking my head because I was reading about all of the admissions to the hospital he'd had over the year before, all the visits to his primary care doctor, to the many specialists, every time a little bit worse. And I also remember, and this is actually a little embarrassing, I remember feeling angry or, or at least frustrated because how could anyone be surprised that this man was about to die? The signs were all there. Had the family not been there for all the hospitalizations and the new medications and the worsening tests? And what about my colleagues? Surely they'd seen this coming. Had no one talked to him about this before? How is it my job to do this in the ER? So all, all this is uh, embarrassing in retrospect because it is such an unproductive way to think about this problem. From my perspective, knowing how the story ends, it's very easy to look back at this gentleman's medical record and say, oh, the signs were all there, we, we should have seen it coming. That's a lot harder in the other direction. The man that I saw in the emergency room was very different from the man that my patients had seen uh, in their clinics. One day, he's a man who is living with multiple chronic illnesses, spending time with his family, going to his doctor's appointments, and the next day he's gasping for air in the ER. The body is incredibly complex and change happens unpredictably and quickly. It turns out we're just very bad at predicting the future. But you know who's really good at predicting the future? Have you ever really liked a movie that's been suggested to you by Netflix? <laughs> Have you ever ended up buying a product that you just happened to see on Amazon? So think about what Netflix and Amazon know about you. They get to know you through a little collection of mouse clicks and time you spend on screen. And now think about what the healthcare system knows about you, what happens every time you walk into a doctor's office, get a laboratory test, get an MRI. It turns out that the same algorithms that predict how much money you're gonna spend online or how much traffic you're gonna sit in later tonight on the way home, those algorithms are also really good at predicting the day that you're going to die. So how good are they? Um, I'll give you some numbers. Our algorithms can trawl through a number of electronic health record data sources from my hospital system, and we can identify uh, a pretty exact probability of death for a number of different patients, and we can identify a group of high-risk patients. What does high-risk mean? When we follow those patients up for six months after we make our judgment, 75% of them have died. Same for low risk. When we follow them up for the same time period, it's about two-tenths of 1%. So those are the kinds of numbers that can really start changing the conversation and how we think about the end of life and how we spend those last months. And we can do that for cancer patients that are starting chemotherapy, or we can do it for elderly patients seeing their primary care doctors for routine visits. It's all just data, and the computer doesn't really care. It's just another outcome to predict. One question that I, that I often get from friends and colleagues is sort of, how, how does this work? What's the, what's the secret? And, um, and I thought what I'd, what I'd do this afternoon is I'd just tell you some secrets. You might be expecting me to tell you something about the fancy master algorithm we're using, uh, or about how many floating point operations our computers can do in a second, but instead I'm gonna tell you about something much less glamorous. I'm gonna tell you about the nature of the data that we use. So here's the first secret. 
The first secret is about the nature of death. The great thing about death, um, and, and there aren't that many great things about death, but sort of, you know, if you bear with me, medically, the great thing about death is that it is very easy to measure. <laughs> there's, there's not a lot of misdiagnosis of death. I did have one uh, Harvard medical student that I can tell you guys about later who struggled a little bit making this diagnosis, but for the rest of us, we don't need a lot of tests. Um, it's, not a, it's not a diagnostic mystery. And that's actually quite important because it makes death very different from other things that we might also like to predict using electronic health record data, like Alzheimer's disease or appendicitis. There's no judgment or diagnosis involved in death. It's very easy to measure. And that's what makes it very easy for an algorithm to predict. So here's the second secret. It's about the variables that we use to predict. Another question that I often get from, from friends and colleagues is, what are the variables that the model uses? I mean, wh what are the variables that end up being important and doing most of the work in the model? And that's actually a, a very human question to ask. The human mind is very good at focusing in on a couple of things that really matter for predicting. And, and we've actually gotten a lot of mileage out of that in medicine. It's how we know that cigarettes lead to cancer or how we know that high blood pressure leads to stroke. But algorithms don't need to focus in on a small number of variables. They don't get distracted, they don't, they don't forget. And so which variables does the algorithm use? It just uses all of them more variables than could ever fit into a human mind, let alone variables that a human mind could use effectively. And if you think about it, that's actually a very deep point. One of the things that makes me most excited about artificial intelligence as medicine is the ability to discover truths that are too complex to fit into our own heads. The complexity of the human body exceeds the capacity of the human mind. And artificial intelligence will become a tool not just for predicting outcomes and improving our health care, but for actually making fundamental discoveries in health itself. So there are a lot of people who are much less optimistic than I am about artificial intelligence in medicine. And those people ask a number of very good questions. Will doctors ever use these algorithms? Will they come to terms with something that they don't even understand? Are they too proud? Or maybe government's the problem. All these complex regulations stifle change. Or maybe healthcare organizations are too fossilized to really adapt to this new environment. And those are all good questions. And to answer them, I've actually got some good news and some bad news. And as tradition would have it, I'll start with the good news. Here's the good news. Medicine has been adopting new technology for a long time. First, we adopted leeches. Then, we adopted penicillin. And this year, we adopted immunotherapy and gene therapy. Algorithms are just another new technology for us to adopt. It's not our first rodeo, and there's a playbook for change. All we need to do is follow the playbook. And that brings me to the bad news. We need to follow the playbook. We need to convince hospitals, insurers, doctors, and especially patients that algorithms are more like penicillin and less like leeches. If anything, our problem in medicine is that we adopt too many new technologies, not, not enough technologies. And this is going to involve publishing in medical journals. It's going to involve running randomized trials. It's going to involve getting regulatory approval. It is a ton of work, but that's the playbook. So I should tell you what happened to my patient. I told him that if he were my dad, I wouldn't put in the breathing tube, and that I'd give him medication that he needed to make him more comfortable, that I'd keep him as alive as I could until his family came in. And that's what we did. His family arrived. They held his hand. We turned off all the alarms. And he died in the ER. And while that might be better than a long, drawn-out process cycling in and out of hospitals, 
I don't think anyone would call that a good death. But you know, that was a few years ago. And so it's not so hard to imagine a few years from now, things going very differently. If over that time, we managed to get intelligent predictions into the hands of more patients and more doctors. So here's what could have happened. Six months before, his doctors could have had the conversation with him. He could have used that time to get his affairs in order, to reconcile with estranged family members, to arrange for care at home, so that when he got short of breath, he didn't call 911. He called a nurse who came over and helped with his symptoms. His family came over too, and he and his family could spend his last few moments together focusing on being human in one of life's most human experiences. And picturing that, it's really hard to understand why so many people are so worried about algorithms dehumanizing medicine in some way. <laughs> Th those people have never seen the inside of the healthcare system. We, we do a perfectly good job of dehumanizing people without algorithms. <laughs> and so I believe that algorithms are going to do the opposite. They're going to let us refocus on what's most important and what's most true about our human nature. They won't dehumanize us, they will rehumanize us. Thank you very much.